Let's talk about photobiomodulation. Photobiomodulation is a generic term used to describe the use of light to stimulate biological tissues. Unlike photocoagulation, there is no structural damage to the tissue. The main light sources for photobiomodulation are LEDs and lasers. The LED, which stands for light-emitting diode, can have its wavelength ranging from near red through red, yellow, and green and the laser can also be found in wavelengths near infrared, yellow, and green. The difference between the laser and the LED is that in the laser, the light is coherent, whereas in the LED, there is no coherence in the light stimulus. The main study involving photobiomodulation in ophthalmology is the LightSight 3 study, in which photobiomodulation was used for the treatment of dry form macular degeneration, and the results of 13 months of treatment are reported. In this study, the laser from the Valeda company was used. As you can see in the lower left corner, the patient positions themselves in front of the device and looks at a light that has different wavelengths. The wavelengths are 590, which is a wavelength around yellow, 650, which is a wavelength around red, and 890, which is a wavelength near infrared. Nine sessions are conducted over a period of three to five weeks, meaning nine sessions in one month. The patient has to attend approximately twice a week to complete the nine sessions. And this cycle of nine sessions should be repeated every four months, that is, three times a year. In the introduction of the study, it is mentioned that photobiomodulation is an established technique to produce beneficial effects at the cellular level. The beneficial effects would be produced through the activation of cytochrome oxidase, which is a protein that resides across the cell membrane. And this would stimulate cell proliferation, cell protection, and promote ATP production with a stimulus that varies in the spectrum from red to infrared. We then decided to check the bibliography cited in this paragraph and verify the evidence of cellular benefit from ATP activation that supports the use of photobiomodulation. This study by Julio Rojas and Gonzalez Lima mentions the concept of a photoacceptor, which is very important for photobiomodulation. The photoacceptor can be a protein that is stimulated by light, mainly by light in the red to infrared wavelength. Unlike the photoreceptor, which is a specialized cell for capturing light, the photoacceptor does not have this differentiation its main function not being light capture. This is another study by Janice Eels et al., which presents the concept of the mitochondrion as the main organelle containing cytochrome oxidase, shown in the figure here on the right. By stimulating cytochrome oxidase, various cellular effects are produced that improve healing and help the retina recover from damage or insults. Here is a model of retinal degeneration induced by animal intoxication with methanol. It is a study conducted in mice that received methanol, and here we can see in the histology on the left, the control. In the middle histology, the degeneration of retinal cells after methanol intoxication, and here in the histology on the right, an improvement of this degeneration with the treatment of the mouse with exposure to photobiomodulation. The study comments that in addition to the histological alteration, they observed marked differences in the levels of genes related to the cytochrome oxidase family. And how was photobiomodulation performed to prevent damage from methanol? Here in this paragraph, it is mentioned that three brief treatments of 2 minutes and 24 seconds with 670 nanometer LED light with 4 joules per square centimeter were delivered 5, 25, and 50 hours after methanol intoxication. This is quite different from what was done in the light site study. There were no stimuli in the yellow wavelength. There were no stimuli in the infrared wavelength. Additionally, the period of stimulus and the frequency used were also quite different. My major concern with the light site 3 study is the lack of animal studies, mainly studies that use the parameters used in humans to verify anatomical and functional changes in animals after this photobiomodulation therapy. 
There are also no studies showing histological changes or electron microscopy changes of these mitochondria. Note that the mitochondrion appears very well in transmission electron microscopy. They could, for example, quantify and verify damage to the mitochondrion if it would recover after the LED light stimulus, and none of this was done or presented in the studies I could verify. So, what we can conclude is that the animals that would be used in photobiomodulation studies are on vacation for now. In fact, they took the mitochondrion with them. Why then do we not find many studies for this type of technology? Because, in fact, the rules of both Envisa and the FDA do not require robust preclinical studies as in the case of drugs. So Envisa states, for equipment that administers or exchanges some type of energy with the human body, it must be detailed what the desirable and undesirable physiological effects triggered by the interaction with this energy are. Therefore, a robust preclinical study is not required, and that is why we do not have these studies. However, the FDA, despite not requiring robust preclinical studies in animals, has not yet approved the use of photobiomodulation for dry form macular degeneration. What happens then in Brazil is that experience is acquired from the authorization of the technology in the Brazilian market in human eyes. And these humans must have some wealth, because as you see in this advertisement, each cycle of nine sessions costs around 10,000 rees. Since there are three cycles per year, it would be about 30,000 rees per year to undergo this photobiomodulation therapy. Let's then see the results of photobiomodulation presented in the LightSight 3 study. This is one of the figures from the study that shows there is an improvement. I would like to draw attention first to the fact that there are three pigment epithelial detachments here before treatment and a very thick choroid. These findings may be associated with a disease called polypoidal vasculopathy. But regardless of which variant of macular degeneration we are dealing with, let's analyze the cases presented in the study. This is a case presented in Figure 6 where there was a theoretical regression of Drusen after photobiomodulation. I will then draw attention to some important points. In the green arrow, note in the upper figure, in the B-scan, that the nerve fiber layer before treatment is thicker than the nerve fiber layer in the B-scan after treatment. Another thing that stands out, look at the pre-treatment photo. There is a red circle here a scale that is removed from the post-treatment B-scan photo, indicating some manipulation of the figure. We know that Heidelberg exports this figure one glued to the other. Additionally, in this ETDRS grid that talks about retinal volume, in the temporal subfield to the fovea, note that before treatment, the volume was much larger than the post-treatment volume. This is concerning because the Drusen or Drusenoid detachment were not located in the temporal region to the fovea. Finally, something that intrigued me a lot. Note in the yellow circle that the pretreatment photo is a standard photo exported by Heidelberg, where you have the near infrared reflectance image showing the height of the scan cut and adjacent to it the B scan photo with no gap between one photo and another. Note in the post treatment photo that there is a gap here in this region between the near-infrared reflectance photo and the B-scan photo, which suggests that a figure was placed on top of the original photo, and in my view, this post-treatment photo does not correspond to the same cut level as the pre-treatment one. And here, just to illustrate, it is a control group where there was an increase in the volume of the retinal pigment epithelial detachment. There really was an increase, but note that what formed was a cleft. The cleft forms when there is a large exudation coming from the choroid. So, probably this case turned into an exudative form of AMD, or it was a case of polypoidal. But in any case, this case, which may signify a neovascular transformation of age-related macular degeneration, is not a good example to place as an evolution of the control group. Regarding the primary endpoint of the study, which was visual acuity, I would like to draw attention because the p-value was equal to 0.02. That is, it was really close to 0.05 and a statistically non-significant difference. What corroborates this hypothesis is that in the treated group, the average improvement in terms of letters 
was 5.4 versus 3 letters in the sham group. That is, the placebo group improved by 3 letters on average and the treated group by 5.4. It is 30,000 reeves to invest on average in 2.4 letters of improvement. Another important point related to the methodology is that the randomization was 2 to 1. The 2 to 1 randomization really weakens the effect of the placebo group, especially in a study that included only 33 patients in the control group. Considering that 148 eyes were included in a 2 to 1 randomization, about 50 eyes were in the placebo group. However, there was a dropout of 25%, and the control group ended up with 25 patients, that is, less than 48 eyes in the 13 month analysis. Another important point of the study to mention is that the conversion rate from the dry form to the wet form in the study was 5.4% in patients undergoing photobiomodulation versus 1.8% in the placebo group. This means that if you undergo photobiomodulation, you are three times more likely to transform your dry form into a wet form, where you will need to start receiving sometimes monthly injections for the treatment of your macular degeneration. Finally, it is worth reading this work by Kirky's group where he comments on the limitations of photobiomodulation studies and considers the evidence of Drusen volume reduction as weak evidence to justify a treatment for dry form macular degeneration. In summary, there are no adequate preclinical studies using photobiomodulation with the parameters reported by LightSight 3. There are no studies related to anatomical changes or functional changes. Invisa, like the FDA, does not require robust preclinical studies, and often the experience with these therapies is acquired after the use is released for humans. The study also does not mention what happened to the patients who developed the neovascular form of macular degeneration. Did these patients receive injections during the study? There are no long-term safety data for more than two years of this therapy. Will more patients develop the wet form of the disease? There is no dose adjustment according to the pigmentation of the fundus. Patients with lighter skin may need higher doses of light therapy, and patients with darker skin with a more pigmented fundus may need a lower dose of light. Some of my hypotheses is the light temporarily increasing blood flow in the choroid, and this may be improving the performance of these photoreceptors. Is this light not contributing to the induction of choroidal neovascularization? Could it be a low-flow choroidal neovascularization that, as happens in some cases of type 1 membrane, improves photoreceptor performance for some time? The effects on the mitochondrion are still very speculative. And here on the right, we even make a joke that probably the rabbit is still on vacation, and now he has hidden the mitochondrion. And finally, I would like to know if I missed any study using this Valeta system in animals, using the same parameters that were used in the LightSight 3 study. Any studies showing anatomical or functional changes in these animals? If you find this study, please do not hesitate to send a message via WhatsApp or to my email. Thank you very much.